Great. Well, uh, as everyone said, I'm Paul, and uh, it's a privilege and pleasure to be here with everyone uh, listening to these insightful and eloquent presentations. Uh, as is my typical mandate, what I lack in eloquence, hopefully I can make up in excitement because we're very excited about what we've been able to accomplish. Um, we're very excited to be here representing Northern Durham and the Township of Uxbridge uh, in specifics. So what I'm going to talk about is a culture of inclusion and how the Township is working to develop an accessible infrastructure. And I'll date back about a year ago, we met Samantha and we were discussing uh, some of our initiatives. And although we're small in stature and we don't have a um, single diversity in initiative, we've incorporated that into our accessibility plan. So I'd like to talk a bit about that process. So a little bit of a background, the Township of Uxbridge is in Northern Durham. It's an amazing spot in Northern Durham if you ever want to go up there. We have a population of just over 20,000 and just under 50% 50, uh, 50 of the population is aged 45 years or older. And that's important as you'll see by the Rotman uh, quote there that disability tends to increase uh, in those persons that are 45 years or, or older. So it really drives home the importance of developing an accessible infrastructure. And just looking at the definition of in infrastructure, the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. And what infrastructure consists of for us is an educational base, policy and procedures that develop the next level of the structure, and then ultimately those tangible physical acts, uh, assets, sorry, trails, buildings, all of those sort of things. So the process that we've gone through to try to get to that point looks something like this. And this may look very utopian and streamlined, uh, but it's actually not. And the good thing about this process is, is that it's constantly reevaluated and we're constantly re-educating ourselves because as everyone knows, accessibility and inclusion are unique to every person. So you're never all, always there. So we go through this process, knowledge and education, integration, action, and constant uh, re Reevaluation and education, and then that leads to the evolution. So, our base of knowledge and education. We started with the accessibility legislation with AOTA. AOTA was there before, but really, when I came on the scene, this is where we were at. So, looking at all that, we assessed the legislation, and although it is good in thought, maybe the layout isn't perfect. So, hopefully, no one from the province is offended by that, but. So it makes a bit more sense maybe to attack it all at once than doing it in the sequence it does so that way you can get to an end point quicker. So we looked at that and we educated ourselves and what we need to do to uh, obtain all those deliverables within the legislation. Then we moved on to integration and there's a quote there that's directly from the Municipal Act and I won't bore you with it but Chair Anderson touched on it earlier, and basically the purpose of municipalities is to, live, to, to deliver good governance. And how do you do that? Well, you be responsive to shifting economic and demographic trends, and you educate and be educated to create an informed discourse, ultimately with the goal of removing unintentional subjectivity and bias, and that includes barriers, attitudinal, technical, and actual physical barriers. So we would go through and integrate these trends into our policies. How do we do that? Council and staff. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our mayor, Gary Lynn O'Connor. She's a true champion of staff because ultimately our ideas don't go anywhere without council support. And I also have to mention our CAO, Ingrid Spellness, and my boss, Debbie LaRue, who's also here, the clerk. Um, people sometimes ask, what does the deputy clerk do? And I quip that. I carry the clerk's bags and I get coffee. So <laughs> if it wasn't for those champions um, going to senior staff and getting the support to get these policies through, we really wouldn't be able to get there. Uh, next is our advisory boards and committees. Uxbridge is small in stature, and uh, someone mentioned before about small organizations. Uh, we have very limited staff, and we're very confined to our roles. So we rely hugely on our advisory boards and committees, which is totally made up of community volunteers. And per capita, Uxbridge, I would say, is leading there for volunteerism. And we've integrated accessibility and inclusion into those policies. Um, next, we have our Accessibility Advisory Committee, which I happen to be a part of, and they've really looked at some interesting things. Again, we don't have that technical expertise or the numbers to go and do individual actions, so we've uh, tried to educate and integrate everything into everything we do. 
And then our BIA, the Business Improvement Area, we actually rewrote the procedural bylaws for a few of our organizations. And within those bylaws that shape the, the BIA and Chamber's actions is actually diversity and inclusion clauses so that they know that everything they do is procedurally based with those initiatives. And lastly, our community organizations. Again, we're very blessed to have groups such as the Bonner Boys and a lot of other organizations that really pour themselves into the community. So when you get that whole network educated and integrated, we can move on to the next step of the process. Actions, so accessible infrastructure and those tangible assets. I'll go back and we'll talk about the facility accessible design structure, and that's a guideline based on universal design principles. Uh, we adopted ours from the City of London, who's long been after it, and Niagara Region also has one. And there's about 75 to 100 organizations in the public sector, municipalities, school boards, universities that have adopted these standards. And it, what they do is they're beyond the building code and they're beyond the legislation right now. And they're saying that you build every structure or you renovate every structure to a universal design standard. So that way, instead of accommodation being the afterthought, accessibility and inclusion is the way you start and then you make those refinements afterwards. So we're not the only municipality to adopt that. I believe Ajax has it, I think Oshawa as well. But what our council did was we went a little bit further and within the resolution and the bylaw adopting these standards, we also passed the resolution that any development proposal would be giving the facility accessible design structures and any developments that come forward that have portions of the development that ultimately we would assume we're requesting they build them to an accessible standard so that way it's done in advance. And that goal is just to appeal to the social consciousness. And then budget as well. Every year with our budget process, we go through with all of our capital pages and then the operating budget, and we incorporate all of those little pieces into our accessibility plan. So some actual successes to date. Um, the use of accessible principles are being used to make decisions, and it's great to see across staff. Um, Come the spring, we'll have accessible picnic tables in every park, so much the fact that accessible picnic tables will dominate the picnic tables in all of those parks. That's very important for us because Uxbridge is the trail capital of Canada. Um, we've also gone through the process of looking at retrofitting all doors in all of our facilities with operator systems and also making all of our accessible routes be on accessible paths. Uxbridge is a culturally rich um, township and we have a lot of older buildings so there's a lot involved to so to see that commitment and direction to start that process again just shows staff's buy-in and when we get to a potential sale or disposal of properties um, budget times are getting tighter these days and tough discussions have to happen about facilities going forward and not saying it's the only point but what we've noticed is staff and council are looking at accessibility and universal design if we should keep these facilities long term and if we can't ultimately make them accessible maybe we should transfer those funds to other facilities that we can make accessible so to see that kind of development is is very very impressive and my favorite story is in October of 2012 when we were just getting ready to send these standards forward the director of public works came up to me and uh, in our township the public works budget is the largest budget by far and they were working on the tender for our new fire hall and it had already been sent out and he had a look at these and he said okay we're sending them out as an addendum for the tender so any designs would be come back with those universal facility accessible design standards and I kind of looked at him like it hasn't even been adopted by council but he sent it out anyway so to have that champion who is the key budget driver it's really great to have in our organization and ultimately just the inclusion is to have accessibility incorporated into everything we do and that that inclusive community and developing target will just continue to evolve and will continue cycling through the process. So thank you.